associate professor in uh, Colorado University and uh, is also part of uh, a researcher in Continuum. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so I'm making sure that this works here. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, at Continuum, um, I'm pretty much um, responsible with some Mark Jackson and Thomas Cervoni. Uh, we are like academic outreach, um, travel universities and talk about Continuum, but also about quantum computing um, and so on. So today I want to um, now um, give the second lecture on introduction to quantum computing. So it's gonna be a little bit uh, different flavor now. So you have uh, been now told how uh, you went from the Turing machine to kind of um, P and MP hard problems and how you would like to have your computer to be able to do statistical computations. Uh, and then you have been shown where uh, classical probability theory kind of breaks down uh, because you have to think about uh, quantum um, mechanical concepts. So um, what we're gonna do now in this lecture is I'm um, gonna make these slides available to you um, and my notes uh, after my lecture today. Uh, I will use the board uh, in conjunction with the slides. So I'm gonna uh, work between the board and the slides. If you do not have a notebook, here's a stack of notebooks, okay? I'm gonna give you now five seconds to pick up your notebook. If you haven't done so, go get your notebook. <laughs> Active writing. <laughs> And there are pens, I think, right next to it. Because we all tend sometimes to fall asleep, which is okay. Wow, I didn't know that uh, notebooks can so, uh, notepads to write on can be that popular. That's amazing. Okay, great. So we still have a notebook, just go around on the side and, and get one, so that's good. Okay, great. So um, let's uh, quickly um, uh, go over the topics I want to cover now in the next hour. So it's quite a lot of uh, material I want to cover. But first, um, I want to kind of tie on to what you have heard right now and talk about logical qubits in a classical sense, uh, logical bits in a classical sense. Uh, and then I want to introduce the um, idea of uh, classical bits versus qubits uh, and how um, they are the unique properties of quantum computing come into play there. Uh, we'll don, talk about the postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview. Each of them are probably a lecture by themselves, but you should get an overview just in case uh, you have forgotten. Then we'll uh, discuss the block sphere, which is a way of uh, visually representing the qubit. And then, well, we'll do a little bit of um, complex numbers and linear algebra, 
uh, that we use for quantum computing, and then um, we'll talk about the quantum circuit model. So I, I will not do any programming yet. Um, uh, when we get to the quantum circuit model, at the end, uh, you pretty much then in the afternoon, you will uh, be um, exposed to ticket, uh, continuums, uh, squ uh, quantum SDK, uh, which is state of the art, and uh, you will learn then how to uh, implement uh, quantum circuits uh, using ticket. That's in the afternoon today. So um, let's get going. So first of all, um, I want you to a little bit of an access exercise here, um, if I can um, connect with you. But uh, first of all, let's, let's go back to kind of like logical circuits. So all of us are used to logical circuits. You know, we have uh, our uh, cell phones that work with logical circuits. So even simpler than our cell phone, uh, what is another example uh, of everyday life where you have a logical circuit? I can imagine like a little chip right, in a, a device at home, maybe? Anyone? Huh? Brains? Yeah? Okay. Anything else? Tim? Switches. Yes, switches. On, off switches, right? Uh, um, yes, so switches. Any kind of like remote control you have, right? These are all based on logical circuits. So, um, uh, pretty much um, logical circuits, as you know, you have um, your, logics, your logic gates, right? And uh, pretty much for logical circuits, you have either a zero or a one, right? So this, this is a logical uh, bit. So um, you start there, and then when you are um, developing kind of like a circuit, your fundamental building block, of logical computing, what you do is you kind of have gates um, that help you um, go through uh, your computation, what you like to do. So um, first of all, in the logical circuits, what you have is you have some kind of like input, right? Then you do something, do something, right? And then you have an output. So we have learned today um, that obviously in order to do that, um, um, you must have some kind of like function you work on or a computation you work on. And in a logical circuit, what you have, you have these gates. And there are many of these gates. Uh, uh, for, like, for example, the AND gate, the OR gate, the NOT gate, right? Um, and each of uh, what these do is you take an input, you have this gate that does your um, computation, and then you get this output. So uh, what you have, see up here is a lot of different uh, tables, right? I do want to write this down. So here you have the end gate, right, uh, which looks like this. Um, and then you have your, your table, right? So the, the, the idea is you have an A going in, you have a B going in, and you have an A and B coming out. So um, this is kind of like uh, what um, logical circuits do. So if you have an A and a B, uh, you go in with a zero, zero, you add them together, A and B gives you zero. Um, so both of the uh, input and output um, uh, have to be one in order to get the one for output. Uh, let's go back to um, how does it work uh, on a level of uh, computation or in a, in a device. So how does it work? So you have typically a transistor, right? So you have a voltage going in, right? And then you have some kind of chip, some material, right, that's very smartly sandwiched together in order to do the computation for you. So for example, you have this chip, when you have a voltage going in, just say for being easy, so one would be one volts and zero would be zero volts, right? You go into the chip, the chip has a smart setup, and then it gives you the output exactly how you would uh, like to put the gate together. So in any case, um, um, so you have all these gates, and then what you do when you have a logical circuit, like I talk, uh, talk to you about, this is for example the NOT gate, um, if you have a logical circuit, uh, you have some computation in mind, what you do is you add uh, these different gates together, okay? So um, I want you to think about it, um, and I'm going to write it down too. 
you also have a cell phone, right? Um, but um, for example, now if you just want to think about very something very simple, your garage door opener, right? So you want to design a circuit using basic logic uh, control to uh, have your garage door open, right? So first of all, you're going to have to have a remote control, right? That either is active or inactive, for example. And then you have, maybe you want to detect the obstacle, right? So for example, you don't want um, your, um, your uh, garage door to close, for example, when there is an obstacle, right? So I don't know how many of you have played with the sensors and the garage door opener. I've spent a lot of time on that in my house. But in any case, so you can think about how could you put the logical circuit together in order to have a garage door opener. So, um, so maybe give you five minutes to, no, five minutes is a little bit too long, uh, but I'd give a little bit of time to think about that. So what you want is you want um, the door to open only if there is no obstacle and your opener is active. Okay? So this is your garage door opener. So the way you can think about it, so A, let's say this is your opener. And B, let's say that's your obstacle. Detector. Right? So uh, what you typically do is you look at the sentence and says like, and, right, is active. There's a couple of like words you can see there. But in any case, what you could do, for example, you can say, well, at the end of the day, I want to have kind of like an and gate, right, where I say that both of them have to be one in order to get a one output to open or close, right? So in this way, you can see, well, this is maybe, this is an input here. I have into my AND gate. But then B, that's your obstacle detector, right? So typically, your obstacle detector is zero when there is nothing in the way, and it becomes one when there is something in the way, right? So um, what you want, you only want to open it or close it when there is no obstacle, right? When I close it when there is no obstacle. So um, you want here and not skate, and you want that to go in here. So this is a not. So only when B is not, there's no obstacle, you want, um, uh, after A being active, you want it to open, right? So you can uh, try and town this call a truth table, right? So you can think about what's A, what's B, what's your output. And you can go through all of these uh, possibilities. So when A is um, active, and when B, when I don't have an obstacle, right, what happens here now in this intermediate step, because uh, B is not active, it becomes a one. So now, um, maybe I should do here, sorry a B, so now it becomes a one, and my output is one, and then my garage door opens, right? So we can go through this truth table to figure out what you're doing. So this is a, um, a classical circuit. And it turns out that quantum computing um, is very similarly like set up, where you have gates that do operations on an input in order to get your output, okay? The difference here is this is a truth table. This is uh, deterministic, right? You know your outcome. We just heard about there's ways of doing it probabilistic. So um, the output for quantum computers will be non-deterministic, right? So there's going to be a probability you have to work with. But we'll build up to this. OK. So um, you have probably heard about um, you know, bits, as we talked about it uh, already. Um, and there's a calculation, right? So, um, 
uh, typically have zero and ones. Um, and if you want to, for example, take a bit string and you want to um, turn it into bit string and you want to uh, turn it into your decimal number, right, um, we can do some math. So, for example, if you want to build an adder, right, you want to add two numbers together, uh, you would represent um, uh, five in terms of bits and six in terms of bits, then you have an adder gate to add them together. You, you build an adder circuit, for example, and then you get again a string of outputs, bits, and then you convert them into your decimals, right, each, which you use on a computer. So um, you know how this goes. So typically you have um, some uh, numbers, right? You have a bit string, and what you can do um, with this bit string is you um, can pretty much say, well, the decimal number is you take the entries of your bit string um, and you um, multiply that number times two to the i, right? So where i is your um, uh, exponent. So how do you do this? And i depends on the position, right? So for example, uh, as an example right now, um, let's look at uh, a value. So uh, example, which I have up next, um, what is the binary number of 1011 in, um, yeah, what's the binary number? 1011 in, in the decimal number. Huh? 11, okay. So um, we have here a suggestion, 11. So let's do this. So 1011, oh, yes, 1011. So this is your first one, right? So this would be now, if you uh, relate it, it would be one times two to the zero plus one times two to the one plus zero times two to the two plus one times two to the three, right? So you have one plus two plus, what's this? Eight, which gives you 11, right? So um, this was a crash course in um, uh, kind of like how you do a logic circuit. Uh, what do you do with bits, right? Uh, you get the deterministic output value. This is uh, 11. Okay. Any questions? So now let's talk about uh, quantum bits a little bit. And um, while I do the active exercise of erasing. Um, so I uh, talked about um, bits, now let's talk about quantum bits. So um, we call these quantum bits qubits, as it says up there. Um, and you can also, um, quantum bits, qubits, um, you can sometimes see the written differently. But um, the unique thing about qubits is that they are, um, you know, not deterministic. And they are kind of, used as a tool to explain to you um, uh, how quantum computing works and what's the uh, uniqueness thing about it. Um, and then uh, we have come up with a very nice and smart mathematical ways uh, in order to do computation on these qubits, right? Um, and describe what uh, they mean uh, in a function because mathematically we like to work with functions. So um, the first thing I want to point out is that you have a qubit uh, you have seen this notation already in the previous lecture, so it can be in state zero, it's a state zero, or um, then you also have your state one. Right, so if you see this notation before, uh, this is uh, written in terms of direct notation, okay? Um, um, so, so zero, as you've seen already, this is, um, in direct notation, so this is a, a column vector. So this is call, also cut, called a ket, right? Um, so ket zero and ket one. So the, the thing about qubits now, which is interesting, is that a qubit is a two-state system. So it can be in state zero and state one simultaneously at the same time, okay? So for, uh, Compared to a, a classical bit, 
you are either zero or you're one. That's it, you have to make up your mind, right? You flip a coin, uh, it's zero, one, in essence, right? So you have to make, make up your mind. A qubit, on the other hand, is both states at the same time. It doesn't make up its mind until we measure it, okay? So this is very, very much different to uh, the classical bit. So um, if you think about it, if you think about, you could have the state zero to be, you spin to the left, and the state one, you spin to the right. But if you're a real qubit, you spin to the left and right at the same time. You don't know what you're doing. You can't make up your mind, right? So um, that's the difference between a, a, a classical bit and a qubit. And it, it kind of like goes uh, deeper than that. But um, that's the main thing right now you have to understand, is that it has the simultaneous properties of both uh, states. And we call this a superposition, OK? So, um, that is the important thing right now, and we'll go through uh, the math in just a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. Good, brownie points. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so, um, um, uh, when you are going through uh, uh, computation, quantum computing, there's a lot of different ways uh, of you are developing a quantum computer. So you can have uh, photonics qubits, you can have trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and they all like um, have a different ways of computation. So a qubit for photons could be a different polarization, right? Could be a horizontally polarized and a vertically polarized and you manipulate the qubits in terms of using kind of like um, uh, photonics devices, filters, for example, right? Rotations and such. Um, if you have trapped uh, ion qubits, then you have some kind of ion, and you think about the different energy levels. So um, a zero qubit will be a lower energy level than um, a one qubit of that, the energy level of the ion. Uh, superconducting, again, has a different ways. Uh, trapped ion quantum computers uh, use typically lasers um, to manipulate the state of your qubit. Um, then superconducting qubits like IBMs, so we have trapped ion continuum. And superconducting qubits, um, then you have again a superconducting circuit, uh, and you use kind of pulses, microwave pulses, pulses and other techniques to manipulate between these two states. So again, these are just a few of them. Uh, there are more out there, uh, and you can look up uh, details. So now let's go into the postulates of uh, quantum uh, mechanics because they're very important for quantum computing. So sometimes you hear about a postulate, you hear about principles, there are different ideas of, um, you know, scientists have come up with uh, um, during history. Uh, some of these postulates, um, you know, were uh, um, kind of like given, and then sometimes um, they then we have done uh, experiments to show that they're true. Uh, some of these postulates are still well, not well understood in quantum mechanics, uh, and we need to uh, understand them better. But in any case, um, um, quantum computing is pretty much a consequence of all of these postulates and principles in quantum mechanics um, that kind of like made it possible for us to actually have actual hardware to run a quantum computer on. So some of these postulates in quantum mechanics, um, how many of you have not taken quantum mechanics? So. Um, Good, so all of you have. Um, so this will be review, so you know that there's the state postulate. So a vector describes a quantum system. Uh, you have the measurement postulate, right? Uh, until you measure something, I don't really know which state uh, your, uh, your system is in. It has to collapse. There's a superposition postulate. I just talked about you have the quantum system that exists in a superposition state of zero and one. And then you have this evolution postulate that you have uh, your state, uh, which you have, your quantum state, evolves over time, right? Uh, which you feel use the Schrodinger equation to de describe that. Then uh, there's different principles. Um, kind of experiments have shown that quantum mechanics follows these principles. Uh, you've heard about uh, the wave-particle duality, for example. Particles exist both wave-like and particle-like uh, features, depending on what you do. Uncertainty principle, right? Um, you know that you, if you know momentum very well, you don't know the position well, right? And vice versa. Uh, that's one of the limiting factors of quantum mechanics. 
And then you also have the entanglement uh, principle, right? So you can entangle states. So when they are far, far apart, you can still kind of communicate with that state. So there's some intrinsic correlation between the two states, and that's also very unique uh, for quantum computing. Then, uh, obviously, as consequences of these postulates and principles, for example, is that you have quantization, so certain physical properties, you have discrete energy levels, right? Um, that is um, um, not very um, obvious from classical mechanics, where you have rather continuous values, right? Your function is continuous in classical mechanics, for example. Then you have interference, which we already talked about today a little bit, that uh, you have the quantum particles that can interfere with each other constructively and destructively, um, and that's um, an important tool for quantum computing. Um, and yes, quantum computing is a consequence of these principles. So in any case, um, you know you study quantum mechanics fairly deeply, um, and then all of these things you learn in quantum mechanics feed into quantum computing, which is just uh, very nice. So um, pretty much now what I want to do is um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about um, superposition principle, right? So we already talked about um, that your qubit has two um, states. It can be 0 and 1. But in principle, you, have, you could have k states, right? So classically think about energy levels. You could populate the 0 state, the first state, the second state, the third state, and so on, right? So you have many states. So classically, you have all these states you could populate with, and each of these states could be assigned to something, um, and you could use that for computation. So in principle, you could have k, do, k of these states. We typically work with two, a qubit of two, right? So with two states, the zero state and the ground state, but you can have many of these. So in principle, you have, um, could have n, uh, k states if you wanted to, um, and people are looking uh, into ways of having more states um, um, in their uh, uh, bits for quantum computing. So um, um, this is something we talked about already. Um, so you have uh, your quantum uh, state, and um, you want to write your wave function. So this is something very important now, um, that when you write your wave function, your Schrodinger's equation, the way your qubit state evolves, so you have a wave function. We typically call it capital Psi, again, in the cat notation. Um, and then what you have, you have a probability amplitude in front of it. So you may have the zero state plus, um, you could call it actually alpha sub zero, I believe. Yes. And then you have alpha sub one for one to alpha sub k minus one, uh, k minus one. Right? So in any case, this is your wave function. This is what you evolve over time with your Schrodinger equation. Um, you can also write in terms of a, a vector, right? Uh, we just did that there. Um, and then you have to have them to be normalized, right? So in any essence, um, your state, your quantum state, um, is a unit vector in the k space. Uh, it, um, it's a comp co complex space, and it has to normalize to one. And we also know this as Hilbert space. Um, and then um, also in order to operate um, on this wave function, so typically when we do operations, we apply a unitary operator to that wave function. Okay? So now we are going to, this is your input, right? Go back to your classical idea of, of gates. This is your input, right? Now you're applying some gates or operators to that input to get a new output, right? So you're doing an operation on your state function, a uh, state vector, uh, and that's how you do it. So these, um, these uh, operators uh, for quantum computing are matrices, and these are Hermitian matrices, and they have a very specific property that um, if you take the uh, complex conjugate or the transpose U dagger, uh, you do U, U dagger, or U, u to the inverse, right, uh, the inverse matrix, um, then you get the identity matrix back. And that's a very important feature uh, of quantum computing. It's a very important feature. We talk about uh, circuit optimization to run it on a quantum computer. To even make it possible to run on a comp quantum computer, uh, unitary matrices are very important 
uh, because uh, we will learn about gates, basic gates of a quantum computer, and they are connected to this unitary uh, matrix. So that's a very important concept. Okay, so now, um, just as an exercise again, um, again, imagine you have uh, these Bauli matrices. These are very common um, uh, in quantum computer computing. Um, these are Hermitian matrices. These are two by two um, uh, matrices. And for example, you want to show that they are um, indeed unitary operators. How would you do that? So you have sigma sec x, which is 0, 1, 1, 0. So how do you show that um, this is a unitary operator? Got it? So sigma x, sigma x uh, conjugate, right? So you have this, this, right? Times the same. Right? And if you do this, because you have to do the dot product between it, right? If you do the math, you should get your identity matrix, right? So that's how you show it. Um, if you wonder how to do this, so you do um, this times this plus this times this, right? Give to this entry, this times this times this times, oh yeah, so uh, this times this, this times this, and so on, right? So you go through um, um, your, your entries um, in that way. Uh, okay. So now um, let's talk about uh, different qubits. Uh, so if you have one qubit, right, and you only have two states, the zero state and the ground state, you write this down in the superposition, uh, where alpha sub zero and alpha sub one are your probability amplitudes we talked about before. Uh, you square these, these give you the probability of being in a zero and a one state. Um, you can write the wave functions term of a column vector instead of the bracket notation, uh, and then you have a unitary matrix that operates on your one qubit, right? So now what happens if you have two qubits? Well, if you have two qubits, it's getting a little bit more complex, right? So now each of these qubits can be simultaneously in the zero and a one state, right? So now you have four different states. You can put your single qubit in, up, down, down, up, or like zero, uh, one, right? Um, so you have uh, four different states, and each of them is gonna have a probability amplitude assigned to them, again, this is your wave function. If you square your probability amplitudes, you get the probability out. Again, you have your bracket notation here, right? Um, this is your column vector, and your unitary operator is now a four by four matrix, okay? Um, also, I wanna say here, we talk about Hilbert space sometimes. So you, uh, your, your two qubit system, uh, one qubit system lives in C squared Hilbert space. Your uh, two qubit system lives in the C to the fourth Hilbert space. Um, if you now have um, multi qubits, right? Now, again, what you have, you have to think about each of these qubits can be in two states simultaneously, right? So now you have two to the n possible states. So you see how this is blowing up quickly. And that's where quantum computing is uh, making big leaps, right? Because if you have 50 qubits, you're already talking about terabytes of information, right? So it's, it's, it's blowing up quickly. Um, so quantum computing is gonna be very, it's impossible to, to like model uh, classically if you have 50 qubits. It's just, you're gonna need too much uh, computational power from a classical computer. So in any case, you can see how it uh, flows up. And you can also see like computationally how it gets, uh, that's why it's so difficult, right? Imagine you have a, a two to the n times two to the n matrix. You have to write it all out, right? And you have to go along. Maybe you have heard about sparse, sparse matrices. That's so much easier in uh, quantum computing to work with because you have lots of zeros you can throw out, right? So it makes it a little bit easier uh, for your computer. But in any case, you can now appreciate why it blows up, 
it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually classical computing can't, um, you know, uh, simulate this. Um, so that should get you an idea about uh, what a uh, single qubit is, what two qubits are, multi qubits. Uh, you, obviously, we can m work with more states, and then it actually gets uh, more um, complicated. Uh, but typically, our qubits now in our actual hardware has two states, right? A zero and a one. Okay, we already did this a bit twice. Okay, so now um, I've, uh, a lot of you have heard about a block sphere. So who has not heard about a block sphere? Okay, so most of you did, great. So a uh, block sphere, this is your physical re representation of your qubit, right? So in essence, what you can think of is that your, your qubit can be either, um, you can think about the qubit being on this block sphere, it's a, it's a vector on this block sphere uh, with lengths of one, and you use spherical polar coordinates to describe the position of that vector. And pretty much what you do when you do a computational um, process, you can think about this, that you have your block sphere, you initialize your, your um, state function, right, in a position, maybe in a zero state, and then what you do is you apply these unitary operators, and what you do is you rotate your vector on that block sphere, okay? Um, so, in essence, that's what you do. So, each qubit is, in essence, a vector on this block sphere of radius one. If you have multiple qubits, you have multiple of these block spheres, and then if you entangle the qubits, the spheres, in essence, talk to each other. But it's a little bit uh, difficult to, um, to draw this picture. But in any case, this is what we use typically um, in order to describe um, qubits. So, it's a, it's, it's a very nice um, visual representation uh, of what a qubit does during a computation. So what you add is you add these matrices. And that's another thing about these Hermitian matrices. Um, uh, they are rotation matrices. So maybe you remember in classical mechanics, right? When you talk, when you go between different, um, um, you go between different, um, uh, yeah, representation, you want to rotate it, right? Uh, on uh, somehow for an ap application, or you want to go to a different space, you have to rotate it. And that's what all unitary matrices are. So pretty much rotations um, on this block sphere. Um, so yes, so pretty much then if you have your, uh, your block sphere, right? And I'm not really good at drawing, that's why I have a picture up there, right? But if you think about this, you're looking at the block sphere this way, so it's, see this is the y-axis, and that's the c-axis. Here we have state zero, and here in the bottom we have state one. And you have a vector there, right? Um, you are, um, I'm thinking about the probability amplitudes, right? Um, so in essence, you can think about the projections, um, but uh, these probability amplitudes are the projections on the c-axis, but then when you actually measure, when you measure a qubit, what it does, it jumps either to this state or it jumps to this state, right? So it becomes then that value on the block sphere and it sticks there, it stays there, okay? So um, it becomes then, uh, once you measure it, this uh, qubit on this state vector jumps to this state or this state. So it collapses onto the zero and one when you do a, a quantum computation. Okay, so um, I'll see your time. Uh, yeah, so this is what I said here in, in words. So um, typically what you do, um, um, if you have one qubit, we already talked about this, um, you have it uh, in a bracket notation. You have your zero state and your one state. If you want to uh, calculate your alpha, right, um, what you do is you um, take the inner product. So you may have seen and remember that uh, in, uh, from quantum mechanics. Um, so you apply the, the bra to your uh, wave function, right? So what is the bra? Um, that's now a row vector, right? So that would be then one, zero. Right? So now this is your row vector. So it's a bra. 
And the other thing was the cat. Right? That would be this way. So in the case it's the inner product, so you have then you have to multiply a row vector times a column vector, and then you get out a number. If it's uh, imaginary, right, you're going to take the complex conjugate and you get alpha squared, which gives you the amplitude. This, you do the same thing for beta uh, and so on. So um, uh, you can do also now, you can map your qubit onto the block sphere. So um, you can take um, this equation here, okay, here, this equation, and you want to map it onto the block sphere, so onto here. Um, what you do in this case is you are uh, told you that um, you know from uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics that alpha and beta must be uh, complex numbers. So you can um, um, rewrite them in the Euler's notation. Um, and then pretty much what you can do is you can go through the algebra and you can um, to go back, right, this was your alpha, this was your beta, you put in your um, Euler notation, which are angles, right, so um, for your Euler's notation, or sines and cosines, if you wish. Um, you can factor out the e to the i theta one. Um, this is a common phase, and uh, this phase, remember what the phase was on the block sphere? The phase of the block sphere took you around, right, like this. This has no effect, like an overall phase does not have an effect on your uh, amplitude, on probability amplitudes, so you can take that overall phase out. And now what you do is rewrite this uh, in this fashion, so now you have alpha, upset value of alpha, and then here you have a phase, uh, a complex, possibly complex number, right, um, here in, in front of your uh, one state. Um, and then you can even go further in polar coordinates, that's a little bit more mathy, a little bit more messy, you have to go through a lot of algebra, but in, at the end of the day, what you end up with is this representation of your psi function where you have your theta, right? Your theta takes you from up to down on your block sphere, and then you have your uh, uh, phi, uh, e to the i phi, that's your phase angle, takes you around the block sphere. So your qubit now can be represented on this block sphere very nicely, so either you can use your bracket notation, uh, which is very nicely um, a way of um, representing it uh, very compacted nicely, um, or you can go uh, onto a block sphere where you can think about rotations on a block sphere, okay? So these are different ways. So when you do a computation, you can think about it um, in these different ways. Okay, so now, uh, the last thing I wanna do now um, is to cover um, uh, quantum circuits, okay? So uh, quantum circuits um, is a way of uh, doing your uh, computation. And um, in essence, what you have here um, is a quantum circuit. I'm gonna redraw this a little bit uh, because LaTeX doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily like show you the circuit um, you will see when you start computation today. So, um, so what you have is a quantum circuit. So typically start uh, with your state, right? That's your input. Then we call this a wire, right? So this is a wire. So now we're gonna do computation for this qubit uh, on this wire. So this is one, this is the qubit one. Uh, typically, actually, uh, we call this qubit zero. So in ticket, what you're gonna see here is Q sub zero. Um, that is gonna be your first one. So now we're gonna do a computation on this wire, so we call this a wire. Time is going this way. And then what we do is we're gonna do a unitary operator, okay? We can apply that to the, um, to the wire. And then we keep going. And then what we could have, because we have two qubits, so maybe your qubit one is maybe um, initialized to an random input, right? It could be a random state function. Doesn't have to be zero, clearly in the up, in the zero position or down position, it could be any. Again, you have a wire, you maybe apply another unitary matrix, you um, shouldn't do U prime, maybe call this U1, U2, 
And then you could have some unitary matrix U that maybe is, a, in this case, a 4 by 4 matrix, right? And it, you can um, uh, now, for example, entangle it and you keep going. And then eventually what you do is you measure out, you measure your qubit. Why do we need to measure your qubit? So we measure our qubit, and then what we do typically, what you have, and this is kind of like drawn differently up there, but here you have your classical registers, okay? So maybe here you have your first one, and here, here. so you have a classical register one and classical register two. So what you can do is you can uh, measure them out, right? Um, during um, the school for the next four days, you will see algorithms that actually can measure things out, and depending on what you measured out and what result you got, you can feed that back into your algorithm, right? So this is pretty cool. Um, we'll do that uh, quite a lot, for example, for quantum uh, error correction and that other like, um, uh, algorithms that have it. But this, this is your input, this is your algorithm, that's your measurement function, right? And obviously what you can have, you can have it even more complex, you could have uh, this classical, um, um, your classical computer, right, have doing some classical computation, and then part of the computation is fed into a quantum computer, and then information comes out from the quantum computer, and then you do a classical computation. So that's also something called hybrid computing. So in essence, your quantum computer will never be by itself. It's always going to have a classical component to it um, that you need for computation. Okay? So, um, so that's kind of like the very um, uh, beginnings of a, a quantum circuit. Um, now, uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, some of the gates you may uh, experience um, um, this week. Uh, one of them is the Hadamard gate. So a Hadamard gate is um, a H gate, right? We call it H. Um, you see up there, it's a two by two matrix. Um, it's a one over square root of two. Uh, it looks like this. And uh, what you do in this case is um, um, here, you can now imagine if you have a quantum circuit, so here you have your uh, initial state, now you apply a Hadamard gate, uh, what is the output, right? Output uh, wave function. Uh, so what you do, um, this is kind of like intuitively, but you, what you do is you apply the gate here. So what we're looking for, the output wave function, is the Hadamard gate applied to the zero state. So now you have a two by two matrix, so we're gonna do this one over square root of two. You have your uh, one, 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 minus one, you apply that to your zero state, right? You go through the matrix multiplication, and what you get is one over, sorry, one over square root of two, and you get one, one, okay? Again, remember, this is your uh, direct notation, right? Right, so this is your direct notation. So remember that your zero was your one zero, and your one was your zero one. So now you can rewrite this as one over square root of two of zero plus one. So what does this Hadamard gate do? It took a qubit that was initialized up on a block sphere, rotated it in a superposition of between your zero and the one state, right? So the Hadamard gate is the gate that puts your qubit into superposition. So you will see a Hadamard gate in, like every, in every circuit in quantum computing because it puts the qubit in superposition. And that's how you do it. You can think about a rotation on the block sphere or you can think about it a bracket notation uh, matrix multiplication. So there are many, many, many two qubit gates you will uh, experience. Um, or see or work with when you do quantum computing. I obviously don't have time to go through all of them, but you know there are um, resources out there. You can Google them and you can see them. Um, 
we have uh, explanation in our ticket, um, um, documentation too. But pretty much these are your different rotations, Bowley X, Bowley Y, Bowley C gates, right? Rotation about the X axis, Y axis, C axis, S gate, T gates, there are different uh, rotations. You can also have gates that don't uh, rotate at a, any given angle, right? Um, so for example, your quantum computer, quantum devices can have unitary operators that rotate just a little bit or a lot, so you can rotate any angle on your block sphere. Um, so you can think about your matrix rotation, you can think about rotation of block sphere, whatever works best for you to understand uh, how algorithm works you develop um, um, then during the hackathon, for example. Um, very important is the tensor product that you will see and you have to um, work with. Um, it's used to combine qubits into a joint state, okay? So first you have two qubits, right? You have two qubits here. They're on each of a wire. The wires don't talk. Now you have to somehow join them, right? Um, so when you do that, uh, you are uh, applying, in essence, a tensor product, but it's more than that. Uh, because when you entangle things, uh, it's getting more complicated. But if you want to um, join the two uh, qubits, typically you use a tensor product. The math is up there, um, which is very important uh, in order to make a joint state. So then you get, for two qubits, you get a two, hold on. So it's like a, a column vector of four entries, right? When you have three qubits, how many entries does your column vector have? Eight, good. If you have n qubits, two to the n, right? So again, very long column vector. Okay, then um, you would, uh, what you're gonna uh, also introduce uh, in your computation is something called the C naught gate. So now the C naught gate, that is your uh, unitary operator that for example, IE C naught gate. Right, so this unitary operator here for a two qubit system could be a C naught gate. Um, and again, there are different types of gates there. In this case, if your qubit one, which is your um, kind of like your initial qubit, right, is in state zero, then a C naught gate acts as the identity gate on qubit two. If qubit one is in state one, the C naught gate applies a naught gate to qubit two, right, so it flips it. So, so again, sometimes you can actually see controlled not. That's what that means, right? So you have now the logical not gate we talked about, right? The flipping gate. Um, so this just means controlled. So you have a qubit that controls the flipping or not flipping as another qubit, right? So that's your, your not gate. So again, you can have um, many, many, many of these gates. You can have a swap gate where you swap your um, qubits, the position of them. Um, you can have your controlled uh, Y, you know, applies a Y gate to a second qubit if, you know, the first qubit is in the one state and such. So there are many, many, many of these, um, um, of these, um, um, you know, uh, of these, uh, processes you can think of, uh, you will um, experience many of these gates. There are also uh, three qubit gates, okay? They're entangled three qubits uh, with different control sequences and such. So um, it goes on and on. Uh, we have developed many of these uh, um, things. And the important thing I wanna say here is that uh, control knot, that's a typical um, a gate operation you can do um, in your quantum computer. Okay, that's how you entangle typically um, uh, two qubits. Can you represent the C naught gate on a block sphere? No, right? So two qubit gates you can represent on a block sphere, um, you cannot represent on a um, block sphere, right? The single qubit gates you can, these are rotations, but the two qubit gates you cannot. So that's why the block sphere has a lim limited representation here regarding how um, you know, algorithms work. Um, that's one thing I wanna say. And then I guess um, just as an exercise, you know, this is a, a very, very common exercise you have seen 
but um, just for, uh, to get us all um, to the start, what you need to do now, um, for example, if you think about the Bell state, um, the Bell state um, is a state, there are four Bell states, and it's, it's kind of like the, the most basic quantum state that entangles um, two qubits. And um, in this case, what I want to do, right? So what I haven't told you now, uh, maybe I should go back. So zero, so now you have the tensor product of zero, right? That gives you now a one, zero, 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 right? Or you can write this as zero, zero, right? So this is your tensor product. So you have two qubits. You put them in the combined state with the tensor product. So now the question is, how can you design this circuit, which is the Bell state, using the gates we discussed, okay? Um, you want to use the uh, lot many gates. You want to have a two qubit gate. You want to use the least number of gates because in quantum computing, we'll talk about it, the more gates you have, each of them are operation with lasers or their operations with um, um, a filter or they are operations with a microwave. And each of these operations will add noise, right? Because your quantum computer is not perfect. It's gonna accumulate errors. So for example, um, one thing you wanna do when you do algorithm development is you wanna apply the least number of gates because each of them gonna add error. So in any case, um, if you want to think about this, what I want here is, again, the one over square do, that's your amplitude, you squared it. So one half of the time, you want to have both qubits in the up position. One half of the time, you want to have both qubits in the down position, okay? So that's what you're looking for. And um, uh, typically, your quantum computer um, starts with uh, some uh, initial states for each of your qubits, and in this case, both of them are up. So just assume that you start with this. You have qubit one, uh, qubit zero. Sorry, this is a little bit confusing, but this is what um, your um, quantum ticket is gonna do. You're gonna have a zero and one qubit, so it's gonna be initialized in the up position, and now we have to do a computation, right? So now we have to put it first into superposition, right? So which gate do we use to put something in superposition? Hadamard gate, right? So we apply the Hadamard gate. So, um, and then um, what you wanna do actually, you wanna apply the C naught gate. And I think you see it differently. So C naught or X naught, uh, it's a controlled X rotation given your target qubit. Sometimes you see this here as, you know, um, you can also see it uh, in terms of this, right? The X. Uh, ticket will give you an X here. Uh, if you work with Qiskit, it has this uh, symbol. And then in any case, you're measuring out, right? So this is then your final state. So um, if you wanna write this down, um, you can show mathematically that, um, I also have to make sure that I get that right, because I always mess up where the I is. Um, yes. So if you want to do it mathematically, what you do is you have um, your zero, zero state you start with, then you have to do a Hadamard gate. You have to um, bring these two qubits, right, um, into a superposition and then you are, uh, apply the C naught gate um, in your, um, to your circuit, okay? So what it, it does here, this, right, so Harama uh, with the identity matrix, this gives you a four by four uh, matrix, so if you wanna write this all out, it looks like this. So make sure that I got that right. Yeah, so let's do it step by step for those who haven't seen this. So uh, zero, zero, is your one, zero, 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 column vector. Um, then uh, what you do is Harama tensor product into the identity matrix. You have one over square root of two, of one, one, um, one minus one. You do your tensor product into the identity matrix. 
um, this gives you then what should you get here? Because again, what does the tensor product do? It puts us into a combined state, right? So you should get a four by four matrix out. So if you do that, you get one over square root of two, uh, a one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, one, zero, minus one. And then what you do is you apply your controlled knot gate. And I'm running out of time, things here. But now if you do your, um, and then, oh, sorry. This is your matrix, I'm running out of space here. And then you still have to apply it to, um, oh, sorry, that's right. So now what you do is you apply this, right, to your zero, zero. Um, um, column vector, and then you apply the C naught gate. Uh, if you do this, um, then you should get your um, final answer. Let's see, do I have enough time? I have two minutes left. So if you're interested, I can write this out now. So if you do the, the Hadamard gate uh, tensor into your identity matrix, then you apply it to your zero, zero state, right? Um, if you do that, you're gonna get one over square root of two of one, zero, one, zero. Now what you do is you flip the C naught gate, you're applying a C naught to this, and that will give you a one over square root of two. So you're flipping it, see not. So what do you get? So did I maybe made a mistake here? Sorry. So zero zero is one zero zero zero. What is your one one? Zero 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 one, right? So you're flipping this, so you get one over square root of zero, 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 one. And then I need here a one, right? So now I have both of these states in here, um, and now you know you're getting their uh, wave function which you were looking for. Okay, so um, I said that I'm not gonna go through any time of quantum computing, but just take this away, right? So your classical bits, deterministic, your quantum bits, non-deterministic, you have a probability. You spin left, right at the same time, right? You don't know until you get measured. Measurement is collapsing on a block sphere and to the top or the bottom. Um, it's actually, you can do a measurement calculation in your bracket notation, um, which is your projection operator. We're not talking about that. Um, and then pretty much what a quantum um, uh, algorithm is, you take your input state function, right? Whatever it is, it's defined by the Schrodinger equation. You evolve it over time by applying gates. All you do is rotations on the block sphere. And then eventually, it's a matrix multiplication, if you think about that, and then you're measuring out what you got. If it's gonna be up, up, down, down, or whatever, and so on. You have tensor products that go into there. Unitary matrices are very important. These are your operators, um, and they must have the properties of U, U dagger, giving you an identity matrix. Um, and if you keep all this in mind, uh, you will be perfectly set up to do your algorithms. So next, after lunch, you're gonna learn about Ticket, how to actually program these circuits into a uh, 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 software development kit, right? And then once you know the tools, we then go into algorithm studies uh, the rest of the day. So enjoy your lunch and thank you for your attention.